Hi, everyone. Um, hope everyone can hear me. If you can't, uh, feel free to type it in the chat. So uh, really excited to be here. Um, welcome, everyone, to Mayo Clinic's uh, second hackathon. Uh, we're super excited uh, for all that's about to happen this weekend. My name is Young Han. I'm a medical student at the Mayo Clinic and one of the founders and organizers for this event. Uh, for some of you, this might be your first hackathon, while for others, you might already be a pro at this. Uh, don't worry, regardless, all of the rules will be explained to you by Patrick Somo at 10 a.m. Central Time. We're really excited for you all to meet one another throughout this event and create something new and special over the course of a weekend. Um, our organizing team consists of a diverse group of people from Mayo Clinic's Office of Entrepreneurship, uh, the Engineering Department, the Medical School, Mayo Clinic Ventures, and the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. Uh, we're all going to be located at the admin table on the left of the screen uh, when we're back in the table format. And so please feel free to come to our table and ask any questions or use the chat. Um, you can use the general chat feature or the direct private message. Um, so now over the course of the next hour, we're going to have two talks. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker. Um, so um, I'm introducing Dr. Dr. Frederick B. Meyer, who is a consultant and professor of neurosurgery. He is the enterprise chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at Mayo Clinic and is recognized with the distinction of a named professorship, the Alfred Yulin Family Professorship in Neurosurgery. He's currently the Juanita Kyoswal Executive Dean of Education of the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science, as well as Dean of the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine. He's held many leadership positions in professional organizations, including President of the American Academy of Neurological Surgery, and Board of Directors of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Um, and with that, uh, excited to hear what Dr. Meyer has to say. Um, please give the next 15 minutes to him. Thank I can. Yeah, good. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you. I, you know, I appreciate the invitation to try to say something erudite, if not just to try to entertain you for a few minutes. I'm sort of a fish out of the water talking about hackathons. So I will tell you that uh, I actually uh, had to look up what's actually what you mean by a hackathon. So I went to Wikipedia and this was the definition of a hackathon, which was really about software design and computer engineering, which, you know, obviously is not at all my forte. So if you can go to the next slide, I went to another source. This was a better definition of hackathon that I found, which seemed to suggest a wide range of experimentation, collaboration, thinking, teamwork together to solve real world uh, healthcare problems. And I presume that that is the purpose of today. So I'm going to work off this one uh, as if I might. So if you go, go to the next slide, good. So I was going to spend a few minutes talking about innovation in medicine with a very uh, monocular perspective uh, giving based on my experiences, right? And, and because I presume ultimately that's the purpose of this healthcare hackathon is how to promote innovation in medicine, how to, how to advance patient care in many different domains. So does anybody know what this, oh, if you go back to that, stay on that first slide for one second. So everybody knows what that is, right? That's an owl. The reason I chose this owl is because that owl can turn or rotate its head 280 degrees either side. Now, I assure you that if any of you rotated your neck that way, you would you die from a, a brainstem stroke because our vertebral bodies don't allow that type of rotation. But this owl has evolved, like most owls, where they're missing key elements of the cervical vertebral column, which allows that massive rotation. It's an example, a Darwinian example of evolution advancing survival. And, and that's how I think about innovation in medicine. So now if you go to the next slide, so hopefully you can see some of these. These are, these are birds on the ocean. So a pastime that I like is I like to go out into the ocean and fly fish 
for certain types of uh, saltwater fish. It's something I, I've grown up with, uh, with my family doing. And so when you're out on the ocean and you are uh, trying to find fish to fish, you look for birds like this because birds are like big indicators saying, hey, there's fish that are feeding. So now if you go to the next slide, this is a photograph of, I took of one of my ugly brothers. So one of my ugly brothers is in that boat back there, that blue boat. And you can see there's a feeding frenzy of a lot of birds feeding. And so he's there fishing and having a fun time. And on the radio, he's just calling me, you know, bad fishermen. How come I couldn't find the fish, et cetera. So if you go to the next slide, I realized that he was cheating. I don't know if I, you probably can't, I can't point this way, but this is a radar. And usually on radar boats, you have use radar in dense fog to make sure that, that you're not going to crash into the rocks or another boat or whatever. But my brother was innovating with the radar and identifying diving birds. And that's how he was able to always get to the fishing before me and show me up. And so you can see in the lower right corner is the, is the, is the boat. But if you go straight up at about 1130, you'll see a green little flare. Those are diving birds. So I use that as an example of innovation adversely affecting my life in terms of competing with one of my ugly brothers. And, and now I'm going to move on to something more serious. So I can go on. So um, another one of my brothers is, uh, is, a, is a, uh, he's a consultant. In fact, in 1996, he wrote the very first book that described the technology and the concepts of platform. He was the inventor of that term platform. And uh, in fact, his entrepreneurship programs are some of the best in the country and his graduate students have, have developed hundreds of businesses. But on the side, he is a consultant in Polaroid. Now, no, most of you don't know what Polaroid camera is or was because it's gone. But when I was growing up, Polaroid camera up on the upper left there, you take a photograph and out would come a, p a printed photograph. It was pretty cool at the time. But they were starting to lose market share. And they asked my brother to consult and, you know, what's going on. And I'm told he went into their boardroom, opened up a briefcase and pulled out a roll of toilet paper and said, your product is nothing more than toilet paper. And if you don't innovate, you will go bankrupt. Polaroid was unable to realize or appreciate the power of flash drive, for example. They no longer exist. If you go to the next slide, please. This is a famous bookstore in Iowa City called Borders. The Iowa Writers Workshop, I don't know if you've ever heard about them, but a lot of wonderful writers have grown up in the Iowa Writers Workshop. I was honored to have the opportunity to read a book of poetry that I had written there. It no longer exists. Most of our major bookstores have closed. And, and why? If you go to the next slide, it's pretty obvious. The Kindle. So the point I'm trying to drive home is that innovation is critical. And if we don't stay on top of innovation, you become obsolete in all fields of activity, including medicine. So next slide, please. No, no, thank you for showing these uh, for me. I, can, I, I appreciate that you probably can't read any of this, but, but this is a graph of, I happen to be a neurosurgeon. And I grew up doing surgeries on aneurysms and tangle blood vessels, things like that. And so when I was a resident, you know, three centuries ago, you would use, you do a craniotomy, an incision, you'd use instruments to cut things out, to clip things out. And, and so way down in the lower left of that slide, I have something termed neurosurgeon and some of the techniques we would use. But over my career, I've seen tremendous advances in neurosurgical techniques, complex skull-based approaches, minimally invasive technology, and now a vascular neurosurgeon, someone who used to clip aneurysms, now needs to be an interventional neurosurgeon to take care of patients. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. If you can go to the next slide, please. So in my small world of neurosurgery, there's been a huge influence of technology on advancing patient care. And the truth of the matter is, for all procedural practices in medicine, 
technology has had profound effects, profound effects on how we take care of patients. So in this little schema, I'm showing you up in the upper left, something called the GAM knife, which is a focus beam of radiation. Down below there, I'm showing you something called proton beam, another way to, do, to direct high energy to a small target in the brain. Let's go to the next slide. I'm showing you to the left, something called coiling of aneurysms and on the right, stents. These are just examples in neurosurgery of how my profession is trained dramatically. But the same applies for, let's say, cardiology and cardiac surgery. Most cardiac disease is treated with endovascular techniques as opposed to a open chest operation. The same is true for endoscopy approaches to general surgery. These are all real life examples for those of you who are going into medicine that if you don't stay attuned to technology, you become obsolete in your professional career, especially if you're a proceduralist. So now if you go on for a second. So uh, these are, this is a drawing, this is a schematic of a blood vessel. And I'm just gonna show you some examples that I find exciting. There's an aneurysm depicted there and a bunch of platinum coils that are detachable filling an aneurysm and treating it. So imagine if you're a patient and you have a cerebral aneurysm, I saw three such patients yesterday, and you're gonna have your aneurysm fixed through a little catheter put into the leg as an outpatient. Compare that to a craniotomy, a five hour operation, ICU stay three or four days in the hospital, dramatic differences. And then over on the right, there's an example of a stent. So these are obvious, but they weren't so obvious 10 years ago. If you go on to the next slides, I'm going to show you some examples. So you can see on that, and this is called a cerebral angiogram. And on the upper left, that happens to be a carotid injection. And you can look in the back of the head, there's a blush of darkness. That's called an arteriovenous malformation. Used to be, this was in a young kid, I believe, a 14 year old. And, and so the treatment for this, these AVMs cause bleeding, brain hemorrhages with about a 30% morbidity mortality rate associated with hemorrhage. They cause seizures, I and mean, it's a terrible thing, and you're born with these things. And traditionally, someone like me would do a long craniotomy and excise that AVM, cut it out through different techniques of cauterization and so forth. What I'm showing you there is the panel on the right is treating that with radiation therapy. So this AVM in this young boy has been obliterated with radiation without a scar on his head. Unbelievable. Next slide, please. Same example. Here's a really nasty, nasty AVM presents with seizures. I happen to know that it's located right next to the frontal operculum. That's your language areas, and it's sitting between your language areas and a movement area. It's in a precarious situation. It's very complex from a surgical perspective. So if you go to the next slide, this patient is going to be treated or was treated with the multi-targeted radiation therapy using something called the gamma knife. And then you go to the next slide and um, it's gone two years later. Wow. Think about that. A high-risk AVM treated without an incision on this person's head. It's phenomenal. That's innovation. Next slide, please. This happens to be a 73-year-old who's having bad face pain, um, severe, severe face pain. And on the left screen there, there happens to be a very complex aneurysm at the base of the skull coming off a structure called the left carotid artery. And on the right screen, especially the lower one, you can see that's been filled with detachable coils through the groin. So here you have a very high-risk aneurysm causing severe pain in someone treated as an outpatient. Remarkable, next slide, please. Same example, this happens to be a very, uh, very, very difficult docleotatic is the term aneurysm of the basal artery, impossible to repair surgically, quite frankly, completely obliterated with coils and preservation of the artery, the patient's fine. Next slide, please. Um, this is a complex skull base aneurysm. If on the left side, you're looking straight at, and there's an aneurysm there, that sort of balloon thing. And um, if we go to the next slide, 
this is the old surgery that I would do. I, again, I don't have a pointer, but take it for what it's worth. In this example, the way I treated that aneurysm was to take a long vein from this person's leg and sew it from the neck artery through a craniotomy to the brain artery to bypass the aneurysm. And so that straight thing down the middle is that vein. That's a long 10, 12 hour operation with significant risk, multiple incisions, et cetera. But look what's happened. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna show you a series. There's a similar such aneurysm there, okay? You can all see, even those who aren't neurosurgeons, you can see there's a normal artery and there's this big balloon coming up, right? So Young Hu, click the next slide. There's the angiogram. And again, this would be something that I might, I would have to do a craniotomy and put metal clips across. But next slide. This was treated with, next slide, a stent. Oh, I guess it didn't show up. Well, you have to take my word. Here's another example. Next slide, Young Hu. I think hopefully you can see there's a wire stent there right in the center. And next slide, cure. So that's placement of a wire stent expanding. This didn't exist 10 years ago. This is all innovation developed across the world, some of which occurred at uh, Mayo Clinic. Next slide, please. So this is just a graph showing what the impact of these type of technologies. It used to be that a neurosurgeon who did blood vessel work did a lot of surgeries or craniotomies. I would say across the country, over 90% of aneurysms are being treated with these type of new technologies. So if you were trying to make a living, if you're trying to help patients through an open craniotomy approach and you didn't have that, you had an advanced your education to be an interventionalist, you'd be out of work. Next slide, please. So this is a, a graph. I don't know how well it projects, but it's a graph of accelerated growth in technologies. This is actually IT technologies. And it's if you think about what's happened in our world, it's really quite dramatic, isn't it? The incredible expansion over time, and, and I don't know if you can read some of those young who, but you can see at the top, I mean, it has all sorts of technology growth, and this is profoundly uh, affecting our world. Um, I mean, this is a cell phone, right? All of you walk around with your cell phone like this, looking who's texting me. Imagine if you didn't have a cell phone. I challenge you to put your cell phone down for half a day. You can't do it. Next slide, please. And so this is an example. Again, I don't know if you can see these well. I don't, and, and Young Hu, I don't know if you want to enlarge them or whatever. But this is an example. This is the number of diseases that right now, today, have been demonstrated to have a molecular basis in the hundreds. So these are diseases, di diabetes, a pancreatic cancer, whatever it might be. Look at the, in the last graph, the little red is how many actually have cures related to manipulation of that molecular pharmacology. So there's a vast world of opportunity in medicine to cure illness and diseases through new technologies, new designs, new pharmacotherapies, as illustrated by this graph. If you go to the next slide. So to, the, to, to today, this is, you know, one of the acronyms at Mayo Clinic, right? This is our strategic plan, cure, connect, and transform. So what do we mean by that? And every one of these demands innovation. So cure, I just gave you an example. Hundreds and hundreds of diseases have a molecular basis that remain to be discovered and cured. I just showed you new technologies, minimally invasive technologies to cure cerebrovascular diseases in neurosurgery. Well, how about using regenerative technologies to cure injury after stroke or to improve function? How about regenerative technologies to treat degenerative diseases like multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's disease? How about regenerative technologies to cure spinal cord injury after breaking your neck from skiing or diving or car accident? 
How about using IT technology crowdsourcing to try to figure out using big data analytics, what therapies actually work and help? How about using analytics to drive best patient outcomes to cure outcomes? You'll, um, in fact, um, yeah, we have a little article in Harvard Business Review about that, Dr. Biden, my colleague that just came out. So the point I'm trying to suggest here is that with cure, innovation is at the cure, the center of cure. Connection is obviously IT, which I think is more in the tradition of a hackathon here. How do you connect to the world of patients? You've all read about home healthcare, right? You know, and the expansion of healthcare to home driven by COVID, right? People would rather stay at home. So now home healthcare is becoming more, uh, more necessary. And I'm not talking about home healthcare, meaning you're old, decrepit, and in your nursing home. I'm talking about the management of current medical problems that affect young people from home. How about the new innovation that's occurring in the iWatch, for example? Right now, you know, you measure your heart rate, your, your I suppose, um, and there's some new technology coming out to measure potassium. And I'm not sure why that's super important, but I think it's fair to say in the next five years, we'll see your phone measuring glucose levels if you have diabetes, measuring blood pressure, measuring core enzymatic activities. That's not too much to think about from a, a infrared technology. It's gonna have dramatic changes. How about connecting to patients who are in Europe or South America or in China digitally in managing their healthcare remote. That's all IT. How about looking at 300 Medicare records, 300 million, excuse me, 300 million Medicare records in which there's tremendous data, outcome data, and, and figuring out best practices, best outcomes. What's the best way to reduce a surgical infection, right? And then transform, that's also innovation, isn't it? You know, the new treatments, I mentioned regenerative technologies, I mentioned uh, sensor technologies, that's all transformation. So what I would suggest is that across the entire spectrum of Mayo Clinic strategic plan, across the entire spectrum of taking care of patients, innovation is at the core, has to be. So if you go to the next slide, these are some, some quotes of people that I happen to think, you know, are, are really quite brilliant. I'm sorry, my screen is so small, so I can't read it too well. But up on the upper left, look what some of these folks said. This is Albert Einstein. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Beautiful statement. Steve Jobs down there. Jobs, rather, excuse me. Innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity, not a threat. You don't wanna follow, you wanna lead. That was another one of his quotes about innovation. And on the right, these are, you know, whenever you're giving a talk and you work at Mayo, you gotta include some quotes from the Mayo brothers. You, you really do, or else you're in, you're in the doghouse. So look at, uh, these are two quotes from Dr. William Mayo that I think talk about innovation. They're iconic statements. Knowledge is static. Wisdom is active and moves knowledge, making it effective. That's what he's talking about innovation, right? Before the word innovation actually came into existence. So these are quotes that are over a century old. The glory of medicine is that it is constantly moving forward, that there's always more to learn. Now, he was talking there about simulation training before the word simulation was ever used in the English language. So very visionary as several examples. So if you go to the last slide, I think, yeah. So I, I, I hope, Yonghu, I, that I did, I, I said a few things that might be of interest to you um, and your team, you know, I would encourage you to really push forward limitless opportunities. And I think the merging of technology with patient care and management is hugely important for the future of uh, not just uh, our institution, but also humanity. So 
I'm going to stop there. I don't know if you want to have a conversation. Young Hu, it's your show. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. There, for those who do have questions for Dr. Meyer, there is a QA chat column on the right that you can interact with. And Dr. Meyer, when you're ready, you can turn off your camera and mic down at the bottom. And that yeah, will I'm working on that and I can't make it work. So keep going. I'm trying. I'll put my thumb over my There, it worked. Excellent. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Can someone give me a, a thumbs up in the chat relay just that you can hear my voice? Okay, cool. Thank you very much. All right. Good morning, everyone from sunny Rochester, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Healthcare Hackathon. My name is Morgan. I'm an MD candidate at Mayo and one of the founders of the Mayo Hackathon. I got involved in technology innovation while completing my pre-med studies. During that time, I worked in cybersecurity and learned a lot about the world of business startups. But before I started my path in medicine, I had a career in the military. There, I met our next guest speaker, Derek Herrera. Derek is an entrepreneur of multiple startups, including Eurodev and Habit Camera. He serves as an advisor and board member for several nonprofit organizations such as the American Technion Society. He's chairman and president of the board of MedTech Vets and is president of the board of directors for the Marine Raider Foundation. In his spare time, which I understand he has, he earned an executive MBA from UCLA and raised a family in San Clemente, California. But when I met Derek in 2014, I was checking into the 1st Marine Raider Battalion. Derek had begun his transition from the service while I was arriving to the unit. I learned from our battalion commander that I'd be leading the team that Derek once led and that I had my work set out for me to continue the great reputation that he had already established. Now it is with amazement and pride that I get to see him again, this time with both of us working towards innovation in healthcare. I hope that Derek's story will inspire the participants this weekend as they work on their innovation solutions to these challenges in healthcare. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Derek Herrera to the virtual stage. Derek, you can share when you're ready. Awesome, thank you so much. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction. It's truly a pleasure to be here with you all today and uh, very excited and, and, and thankful for this opportunity. All right. All right, uh, so again, thank you so much for everyone at the Mayo Clinic for putting this, this phenomenal event on, Morgan for, for inviting me to come share. And it's truly incredible to be with people like yourselves, innovators uh, and medical professionals who can achieve and accomplish so much on behalf of improving care for patients. And so before I start, just have a few disclaimers. One, I'm honored to represent a lot of communities such as the Special Operations Community, the Marine Corps, uh, my companies, nonprofit organizations, but I'm just here with the hopes of being a good ambassador and sharing some of the insights that I've learned from those organizations, not in any formal capacity to represent them. And two, most importantly, uh, you'll hear through my story some amazing things that I've had the, the, the opportunity to experience, but uh, I would claim that these experiences don't make me any different than you. In fact, we're the same. And so this journey that I've been through and things I've learned about resilience and fortitude are things that I think are incredibly impactful and important for any human being, including yourselves. Uh, and so my goal is to share things that I've learned uh, through some very challenging situations, but that I'm no different than you, uh, despite the, the events that have transpired in my life. And so I, my hope is that some of these lessons that I've learned may be able to help you as you continue to move forward on your own journey. Uh, as medical professionals, as innovators, and as, as good humans. And so key takeaways up front, um, as I was reflecting on my journey uh, from the military to becoming a medical device entrepreneur, I'd thought of some of the cycles that, that I'd been through that had enabled me to accomplish and create lasting change in the medical device industry specifically, and uh, came up with this basic framework that that I'm working on uh, and developing, which I think has the major aspects of innovation and change. And so uh, starting with awareness, uh, critically important to know yourself 
and to know your environment. So situational and self-awareness, understanding and, and framing the problems that you're trying to solve. Uh, and as medical professionals, obviously respecting evidence and all of the, the data that's been uh, created and developed before your opportunity for improvement, but also critically important to, to refuse to accept things as they are. Moving into bias for action, uh, you know, having the the wherewithal to make the plan and to take action to accomplish what you're setting out to accomplish. Along the way, rallying support and what I like to say, go together, uh, because I've never seen anybody able to create lasting change by themselves. Everything is a team effort and attracting people to your cause and garnering resources and and getting uh, stakeholders who are as passionate about creating change as you are is absolutely essential in doing so. And then execution. And so um, I have a mentor, he says, ideas are free, uh, but execution is everything, right? And so relentlessly executing the plan, pushing forward through adversity, but understand that this is also a cycle. So as you begin to execute these plans, continuously being aware of how your environment changes and, and how uh, your technology may change as well. And so this is just a brief overview. Uh, this is definitely not perfect. It's just something I started to put together as I was preparing for and, and retrospecting on some of the events that I'd been fortunate to experience. And so taking it back, uh, my journey uh, started in my youth. Uh, the military uh, was my family business. And so I was always exposed to it. Both of my grandfathers served as Air Force officers. Uh, my father, sir, or see, they were enlisted in the Air Force. My father served as an officer in the Air Force. And so I was always exposed to this uh, and always understood that, you know, this was an opportunity for me to go forward and to serve the country uh, as a military officer. The other thing I did as well was I was also very uh, technically oriented and I think almost an engineer from a very young age playing with Legos and taking apart VCRs and not being able to put them back together, which uh, didn't quite uh, please my parents much. Um, and then lastly, and most importantly, I was very stubborn. Uh, and so it may be unsurprising to some of you that I found a home and a good fit after graduating from college in the Marine Corps. Uh, and so while I was at the Naval Academy, I studied engineering, so I systems engineering. And then in 2006, uh, shortly after I graduated, found myself leading men and women in military operations across the globe in places like Iraq, Haiti, and other countries across the Middle East. I had such a phenomenal experience leading these teams and serving the country that I decided to continue serving in the Marine Corps and to take the selection for the Marine Special Operations Community, which is now called the Marine Raider Community. And I did this because I wanted to have an even greater impact uh, than I did while serving as an infantry officer with the best Marines possible that, uh, that I'd have the opportunity to serve with, uh, conducting the most challenging and, and important missions on behalf of our nation. And so I passed the assessment and selection process and began uh, training as a Marine Special Operations Officer in 2010. In 2011, I graduated training for the Marine Special Operations Command and, and took charge of a small team of about 20 Marines and sailors who was tasked with deploying to Afghanistan where we were conducting what was called village stability operations. This mission required us to embed in a small local village and help them develop the infrastructure to resist the influence of uh, the Taliban in this regard. This was a very co complex problem set for us where we were required to think strategically to establish security, revive economic development, and link political governance from the local to the national levels. What you see on this screen and a big part of our mission was to train the Afghan local police, and this was our, our partners. And so we were incredibly proud to to train and mentor these individuals because we knew they were the success, uh, they were essential to the success of our long-term strategy and our strategic interests. And so at this point, I was at the pinnacle of my career and doing exactly what I wanted to be doing with the people I wanted to be doing it with uh, and having the impact that we saw to create on the battlefield. And so I, I would have gladly done this job for the rest of my life. Um, and then in an instant, my life changed forever. And so on the morning of June 14th, 2012, I led our team on a patrol to investigate an area of our battle space uh, in the Hellman River Valley. And in the opening moments of this engagement, I had been shot while on a rooftop uh, with a bullet from an AK-47 uh, that lodged 
in my spinal cord uh, at the T6 and T7 level. And so while on the rooftop, I slumped over, tried to triage myself, uh, was immediately paralyzed from the chest down. And so realized that nothing below my chest level was working, picked up the radio, made a call to my teammates and, and communicated to this, the, this to them, uh, and they sprang into action. While I was laying there, uh, still under enemy fire, I realized that another sergeant, uh, another Marine on the rooftop as well, just to my left, had been shot uh, through the neck and was laying face down and, and unconscious and uh, didn't know if he was alive or dead at that point. And so after that call went out, our team sprang into action uh, and all we could do was wait until they were able to get us off of this rooftop and triage us. Uh, it was a very chaotic situation. We only had 10 Americans on this patrol uh, and 10 of our Afghan partners uh, in this small compound isolated uh, where we were taking enemy fire, uh, heavy volumes of enemy fire from multiple directions. And so now with two members critically wounded, uh, it became a very intense battle for survival. And so they quickly sprang into action and began taking uh, the steps necessary to help keep us alive repel the enemy assault and get us off of the battlefield. And so as that was occurring, uh, I was still awake and uh, in good condition for the majority of that time. Uh, whereas the sergeant to my left, Rick, was you know still unresponsive. But due to innovation, uh, our medics were carrying something called Cellox, which at the time was the, the clotting agent that we were using. And because he had been shot, in one side of the neck and out the other, and we were unable to use tourniquets to treat that. This uh, material, this product, uh, actually helped to, to to clot and to reduce the bleeding to a level where he had uh, awoken and been revived and, and stabilized enough to get him off of the battlefield. But while that was happening, uh, because I'd been shot through the shoulder, uh, blood started to pull in my lung, my chest cavity, which uh, caused me to take a turn for the worse. And so fortunately, the team was able to get a helicopter to come in, land, uh, and get us off of the battlefield. And uh, this was no small feat. And so this image that you see on the screen is actual footage uh, with me and Rick, the sergeant, being carried by members of our team onto the medevac helicopter. And what you'll see in this image is that each one of these men ran out there and carried us to the helicopter, were unable to, to return fire or to defend themselves as they ran out into the open in this field uh, to try to carry us on there. And so without hesitation, they pushed forward to accomplish this mission. And I'm alive today because of the selflessness, the heroism, and the bravery that everyone in our team displayed. And so on that day, every one of those men risked their own lives to save mine. And so looking back on this day, I can say that this was the best day of my life, but also the worst day of my life. And so it was the worst day of my life because I'd been injured permanently and I have this lasting physical condition that I still deal with to this day as I'm still completely paralyzed from the, the T6 level down. But it was the best day of my life because as a, a leader of teams, the heroism, the bravery, the selflessness of the team members and the level of, of commitment uh, and courage that these, these Marines and sailors displayed uh, as a leader, I'll never be as fulfilled with any event that I, I, I do for the rest of my life. That was the pinnacle of leadership. And I was very fortunate to, to have been able to witness that, that environment and that, that situation. Um, and it's something that I don't know that will ever be matched for the rest of my life. And so this is why I consider this the best and, and worst day of my life. So when I had to return to the U.S., uh, I began to, to adapt to the reality of a spinal cord injury. And so I was trying to survive in the initial days and, and working to regain as much function as possible. Uh, but prior to this, I had very little knowledge or, or no knowledge of what spinal cord injury was like or what dealing with neurological injuries uh, would mean for any sort of recovery. And so I immediately thought, you know, will I ever walk again? 
And I thought that was going to be the biggest challenge that I faced. But what I quickly realized was that there were so many other challenges associated with having paralysis and spinal cord injury that would be as challenging or more challenging than being able to walk again. Regardless, I, I set out and created goals during my recovery to try to try to accomplish as much as I could and to recover as much uh, function as possible uh, to, to, you know, move forward after this injury. And one of those goals was to be able to leave the military uh, walking and standing and on my own two feet. And so this is something that, you know, 10 years ago would have been unthinkable, right? A person who's completely paralyzed, how can they stand and walk, uh, you know, without using a wheelchair, but due to the passion and the drive of, of other entrepreneurs, uh, there was actually a system, uh, a robotic exoskeleton system, uh, which in this case was called rewalk robotics that was developed and FDA cleared in 2014 designed for people just like me, which was a device that I could strap into and enable me to stand and walk, uh, without using a wheelchair. And so I'd set this goal, uh, to aspire, to leave the military on my own two feet. And I was able to achieve this because of the hard work and the foundation these other entrepreneurs had, had laid. And so this for me was an experience that, that not only made me, you know, uh, proud and fulfilled having achieved this goal, but it, it made me question some of the fundamentals that I thought to be true, specifically with respect to my self-awareness and my situational awareness. Uh, prior to this, you know, I never would have questioned some of these assumptions about being paralyzed and, and not being able to walk. And having met the founder, the inventor of this system, Rewalk, who was also a quadriplegic, who was really no different than me. He was just an engineer who had been injured 20 years ago and set out to create this change and started building these devices in his garage. Um, but due to his commitment and passion to solving this problem, was able to, to develop a system that helped people across the world now uh, and has created an entire industry with multiple competitors in this space. Um, I realized that that I was limiting myself. I was, I was limiting myself uh, and preventing you know, myself from accomplishing and, and creating change for myself and others. And so, you know, I, I had this, this epiphany, uh, and this is what propelled me to move forward in the medical device industry as an entrepreneur and to try to try to make change for others, uh, in a meaningful way. And so I set some really ambitious goals, uh, ones that, that made me uncomfortable. Um, and the only way that I would be able to know if I was able to achieve those was to try, right. To go forward, make plans and take action and, and to go for it. And so, I was fortunate uh, to recover and had gone back to business school part-time as UCLA executive MBA program. Um, and during that time, I, I was, was able to get around, right? Mobility was not a major issue for me. I was able to go to China and see the Great Wall. I was able to go on safari in Africa and Tanzania for, for days. But the biggest challenge I faced on a daily basis was bladder management. And so I struggled with things like infections, false passage, strictures, incontinence, spasms, autonomic dysreflexia, all these, these challenges associated with chronic catheter use. And in the, you know, the aftermath of my injury, I actually found myself at a, a naval hospital in Camp Pendleton with the urologist literally laying there on the table while they're having issues with, with passing catheters. And I said, hey, doc, there's got to be a better way than this, right? And he says, no, no. Um, this is all we have, you know, intermittent catheterization, Foley catheterization, and, you know, and for some people, super pubic catheterization. And in that moment, I became obsessed with solving this problem, realizing that, uh, that I should refuse to accept the way things were and that there was, there was absolutely a way technology could improve bladder management for people with urinary retention. And so that was 2013, uh, about a year after my injury, when I had that experience. And then worked to create a company called Eurodev Medical to address this. And so all the while through business school, had this idea, uh, which centered around a very basic concept of, uh, you know, being able to push a button and empty your bladder, uh, despite not having any functional aspect, uh, you know, 
uh, with bladder emptying and the voiding process. And so um, didn't know what I was getting into, obviously, because I didn't have a ton of experience. I took a, a, an internship at another medical device company to try to gain a little bit of experience, but but took a leap of faith and just started this company in 2015. And, and over time, uh, was able to attract the people and the resources necessary to make it successful. And so this is our product. Uh, it's called the Connected Catheter, and it's a system for bladder management uh, that enables people to do what we set out to do, which was to enable them to, to push a button on a remote and wirelessly control emptying of the bladder. And so this started literally as a napkin sketch um, six years ago, but now we've gone through multiple clinical studies and are working with the FDA now to try to get this product on the market. And so some unique aspects of this technology is that it's fully internal to the male anatomy. So there's nothing hanging out of the body. Uh, it's wirelessly controlled and has an active emptying mechanism. So if you think of a, uh, a turbine or a jet engine um, or a propeller, uh, for those of you that like fishing, um, we're actually pumping urine, helping to completely empty the bladder. And then lastly, uh, we made it simple enough that we can train users to insert and remove the device in their own home. And so the device lasts for about seven days in the body uh, is our target. Uh, and users can insert and remove this in the comfort of their own home. And so this is what I've been working to accomplish uh, over the past six years. And, and we're closely getting on the market uh, and creating a better way for any adult male dealing with chronic urinary retention, mainly because of those foundational aspects of the cycle of change and innovation that I showed before, specifically with, you know, refusing to accept things as they are and executing relentlessly while still maintaining awareness of the situation and, and ourselves. So this is what I've been working on the past few years. Uh, about a year ago, though, as things matured, I transitioned this company to a professional CEO uh, and moved it to, to Minneapolis. Um, and so that's freed me up a little bit to try to scale my impact. And so the next project I started to work on was a project called the Habit Camera. And so this was a device that had been invented initially by researchers at the Minneapolis VA, and we worked to license this technology and the patents from them. Uh, and it's a very simple device, which we're, we're hoping to commercialize in the next couple months. And it's designed for skin inspection. So it is the first low cost digital tool for skin inspection that enables users to comfortably view their skin in real time with a smartphone or tablet uh, app. And so they can see their skin, uh, they can record these images and share these images or videos with clinicians by email, text, or, or you know, through other telehealth platforms. And this can be valuable and useful for anyone with uh, dermatology concerns like skin cancer screening, um, wounds like diabetic foot ulcers, uh, or even pressure sores for people that are wheelchair users or have limited mobility. And uh, something very simple, very basic, and hoping to really help a lot of people uh, with, you know, skin self exams and, and, and screening, uh, because we know that for skin cancer and for wounds in particular, um, you know, early intervention is, is critical to improving clinical outcomes for them. And so this has been a, a project that's, that's come along very well, and we're able to leverage the foundation from the VA researchers uh, who spent a long time working to, to develop this product. So very excited about this technology and the impact it'll hold for, for so many as well. And then lastly, most recently, uh, I haven't publicly announced this yet, but we're starting a company called Bright Euro, uh, which is going to develop some advanced uh, sensing technology for the bladder, um, which we think will also be incredibly valuable uh, and impactful for, for people with a variety of conditions uh, dealing with lower urinary tract symptoms. And so this is the one uh, which we'll be announcing shortly um, and hope to have an impact with as well. And so to summarize, uh, I'll come back to this, this cycle of change um, and to just briefly reiterate some of the, uh, the things that I've learned, you know, through my own personal journey and my experiences. And again, starting with situational and self-awareness, I uh, can't stress that enough. And I didn't cover it because of, you know, time considerations, but one key aspect of that that helped me with that uh, and understanding that is, is a stoic mindset. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the stoics and stoic philosophy, but that helped me to understand uh, 
you know, and to, to experiment, to, to identify the boundaries of what was in my control and what was not in my control, you know, and understanding myself and my environment. Obviously the problem framing, like I said, you know, respecting modern medicine, but at the same time, refusing to accept things as they are, uh, taking action, uh, you know, not ensuring, ensuring that, you know, not, uh, you're not waiting for things to be perfect before you're willing to move forward and to, to make change, building the team and, and going together to rally support and garner resources and then executing relentlessly and pushing through adversity. And so this is, again, the, the personal cycle of change that I've experienced. And, uh, and this is, is what I hope you guys will be able to take something away from. And so thank you all so much for your, your time and for listening today. I'm honored to be able to share a little bit about my personal journey with you. Uh, again, never would have expected to end up in this field, but I'm so fortunate that I did. I'm fortunate to be alive and, uh, and fortunate to share this, this time with you all. Uh, again, I want this to be totally relatable. And, and the one thing that I've learned is that I'm no different than any one of you, right? If you live long enough, especially in your profession, you'll deal with challenges and trials and tribulations. And I hope that some of the things that you learn can help make you more resilient before you're tested in those ways so that you can bounce back and move forward and push through adversity uh, and, and be better uh, and be more effective in all that you do. So uh, this is my email on the screen. And so if I can ever be of service or value, if you have any uh, interest in chatting more, uh, I'll be here for Q and A, obviously, um, but feel free to reach out to me directly at any point in time. And and truly honored and and grateful for this opportunity to share uh, with you all. And uh, thank you, Morgan, for for all that you've done to put this together and for inviting me to to attend. So thank you so much. Thanks, Derek. Um, it's not quite ten, so we do have time for some questions. If anyone, uh, I, I see one already. Can you read them, Derek, or you want me to read them off to you in the Q and A? Yeah, I can read them. All right, you got it then. Yeah. Okay. So from Dr. Nelson, Dr. Tim Nelson, perspective of situ I'm interested in your perspective of situational awareness and why that is an important first step. And can you share more about this key step? Um. So, I think. The cycle isn't always continuous. I'm still working through this a little bit, but if I go back one slide, just to show this, I don't know that it's uh, it's necessarily sequential or in series. Some of these may be in parallel as well. You know, you may be able to experience a problem and then continue to become more aware. But in general, the the key aspects of of situational and self awareness, I think is that it's foundational to a stoic mindset. And so for stoic mindset, um, the basic concept is focus on things that are in your control and, and don't worry about things that aren't in your control. Um, but the key underpinning of that is how do you know? You know, how do you know what's within your control and what's not? And I would argue, and this is this is the one of the biggest lessons I've learned, that, that I would argue that the only way for you to know is to be situationally and self-aware, but, but to actually conduct small experiments, right. And to try and to fail. Um, and so if you set audacious goals and say, I think I can solve this problem by doing this, uh, the only way for you to know if you can do that and create change in your environment is to try. And although you may fail, the only way for you to learn the boundaries of what's within your control is to, to take these, these, experiments and to try right so you know one experience uh i recently did a pull-up challenge right and despite being paralyzed i can still do pull-ups and so i tried to do a thousand pull-ups over the course of a month for charity and and i didn't know if i could do it but i set out to try and i was able to do it and so uh, i think consistent experimentation is is ultimately at the root of understanding what's fundamentally in your control and not in your control. And I think especially as, as medical providers and clinicians, uh, you know, you're in this position where you have to respect the evidence and the data and everything that, and all the procedures that have been developed over decades or centuries before you, but at the same time, uh, understand that there may be better ways to do it and to try and, and, you know, be willing to, to, to take risk and accept failure. So, so I think that's, 
that's what I would suggest for the underpinnings of situational and self-awareness, Dr. Nelson. Next question, in your experience as an entrepreneur, how do you differentiate good ideas from great ideas that will give you priority and focus? Um, any of these ideas that I, I see and experience uh, or have the opportunity to review, um, I've put together a basic model um, for what I should pursue and what I shouldn't pursue. Um, and so I've learned over time the key aspects of success, but a lot of it is tactical. Uh, and so there's a fundamental requirement for some, some basic things, at least in a, a corporate or for-profit setting, which in most cases as an entrepreneur, uh, the profit incentive has to be there or there won't be an ability to create lasting change because it won't be sustainable. Um, and so in that environment, there's a few key things that, that have to be included. Otherwise, you can't pursue it, right? And so those things are like intellectual property, um, market size, uh, technological feasibility. And one of the, the, the seemingly, you know, this, this shouldn't be an issue, but it is uh, reimbursement, right? And financing. Um, you know, so if you come up with the best device possible, but you don't have a way for it to be paid for, it's going to take a long time to create that change because Medicare is hard to deal with, right? And I'm learning that firsthand. You know, the fact that it takes on average three and a half to four years just to get a new billing code, all these things are, are very challenging. So, you know, so understanding the economic impact and the economic health value proposition of any technology and having a solution for that is very important. And so, um, so those are the basic tactics. And then for me personally, what I look at is... Um, when I was in business school, you know, what I, what I thought of was of all the things I could do, is there something that only I can do? And the answer was, was, uh, yes, there is, but it should be focused around spinal cord injury, right? Because there's not a lot of people dealing with these types of issues for spinal cord injury or trying to create change for spinal cord injury. But I'm obviously passionate about that because that's the injury I have and I'm trying to help myself, but that that insight will actually help be a competitive advantage and help me move forward and create pro products that, uh, you know, people that didn't have a spinal cord injury wouldn't be able to, to, to do. And so, so that's the basic idea, um, for how I, uh, how I've tried to assess these, uh, these opportunities. All right. Let me see any other questions. I saw some questions before, but it looks like they all uh, yeah, we were marking them answered. Uh, the last one we'll do before we transition uh, off you, Derek, uh, Destiny Green asked, what advice you'd give to medical students who have an interest in innovation, but don't have a background in business? Yeah, so um, I think they have uh, networks. I'm, I'm certain somewhere in the region, you know, you, that you guys are all part of there's there's networks for this. Um, and then even if not, there's, there's opportunities to do this virtually, but, but building a network with other innovators, um, other people who are entrepreneurial and in entrepreneurship, uh, just getting involved and plugged into those networks can help you, uh, meet people and learn about things and, and, uh, and get involved. And so, uh, so if you don't have the experience, um, there's a couple ways to get it right. One is you can go collaborate, you can consult, you can advise with other medical device startups. You can join other medical device startups. Um, there's no shortage of startups that need clinical expertise. And so you obviously bring something valuable to the table that you can help them with your knowledge and your expertise and your experience. Um, and so, you know, for example, at UCLA, they've created kind of a cross-curricular uh, biodesign curriculum. I think there's things similar in Minnesota with University of Minnesota um, and probably other other regional incentives. But but even if not, just getting on LinkedIn, you can find people who are medical device startups, medical device engineers. You can find these networks. I was just in Minneapolis this week uh, at a conference and it was called the MedTech Conference. But as part of that, there's a program called MedTech Innovator. And they have, uh, it's a nonprofit, but they provide prize money for med tech companies that can compete and apply. And um, they have over a thousand companies, startups apply for this program every year. And so uh, that organization in particular takes volunteers and um, 
the volunteers help screen applications and you can get plugged into their network and everything else too. So, excuse me. So there's, there's a, a few ways that you can get involved, but I think it's just all, a lot of it's just networking and putting yourself uh, in the position to be around other people who are um, trying to solve problems, right? And, and inherently, if you're around them and getting more involved or more plugged in in the scene, then, uh, you know, you, you can find them. And you don't have to move to Silicon Valley. You don't have to, you know, move to Santa Monica. You don't have to do any of that. It's all digital. You can, you know, I got an inbound request from someone in Ireland who was a clinician who said, hey, I'm entrepreneurial. I want to learn about this. This is my expertise. Uh, are you looking for any advisors? Can I help you? And, you know, he just sent me a message and I replied and we became friends and, you know, stay in contact. So, so that would be how I'd suggest to get involved. Okay. Uh, there's Derek's email again. Thank you so much, Derek. It means a lot. Um, it's great to Pleasure's be all mine. this with you. Yeah, dude. Thank you so much. No, the pleasure's all mine. And uh, I'm really excited uh, for all the things that you guys are going to do this weekend and, and continue to move forward and um, you know all the things that you'll do throughout your careers. So I'm honored to have this opportunity to, to share some time with you and uh, wish you all the best. And please don't hesitate to reach out or connect with me on LinkedIn.